we hang on the fact that part of the immune response is to shed epithelial cell. And that is the way that eventually you, you, the aim is to get rid of those bugs. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Malone Lee, a researcher and clinician with a long history of working with recurrent and chronic UTI patients. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. Thanks Hello. for inviting me. <laughs> of course. We, we got a huge amount of questions from our audience to try right. and cover, so I do want to jump in, but I think it makes the most sense if you first tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be working in chronic UTI. Okay, after I qualified uh, in uh, the 1970s, I, I, I went into the army where I worked as a, very, very happily as a, a medical officer. And then um, at a later stage, I decided that I wanted to learn neurology. And because the British Army at the time didn't have a neurologist, uh, I became, I managed to persuade them to let me be the neurosurgical registrar for the then neurosurgeon who was at Guy's Hospital, Peter Scher, who in fact died last year. And for two years, he and I worked together very happily, uh, and he taught me a vast amount of neurology. And during that time, one of the things that people don't appreciate is about 60% of uh, battle injuries involve a head injury, mm -hmm. so that we were, we were dealing with head injuries coming in from various conflicts. And uh, I, I began to notice young squaddies who were having troubles with blood control or incontinence, and there didn't seem to be much on offer to them. Anyway, eventually I'd done my time with the army and, and the, the, the authorities felt that it would be unwise for me to stay on and that I would be better off in a university environment. And so that they helped me, in fact, and I, I, I went to University College London, but by then I wanted to study the bladder and the only way really of a physician, an internist, uh, to study the bladder was to become a geriatrician. So mm -hmm. I became an academic geriatrician. And in fact, for 20 years, I then worked on urodynamics. Um, and then in about the, the mid 90, early 1990s, I began to, I, uh, really, I, I, I was working on uh, means of being able to produce mathematical uh, ways of interpreting the urodynamic data so that we could scrutinize it in relation to the experience of the patient and the pathophysiology. And uh, it took a long time, but the, these, these equations were certainly working. But when I applied them to the clinical situation, they just didn't fit, didn't mm -hmm. fit at all. And after a long time, I managed to work out that it was urodynamics that was lying and not the patient. Mm. And uh, the, particularly in relation to the overactive bladder detrusive instability, I just said, look, I think urodynamics has got it all wrong, which went down like a lead balloon. Mm -hmm. We conducted a major, major randomized controlled trial in order to, to check this. And in fact, it came out. The aerodynamics was irrelevant. So at that stage, I needed to, to, to look for a, a different means of, of trying to explain these symptoms of frequency and urgency, the overactive bladder. And it was just, I was visited Palo Alto in order to work with Roche Bioscience on, on, on some science. And in the evening at dinner, somebody made some chance remark that made me think. And on the red-eyed flight back, I kept on thinking about this. And when I got back to London, decided to start looking to see if um, the culture results were telling us the truth. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I was just using dipstick. And to my horror, mm -hmm. just using dipstick, I found that the, the culture results appeared to be lying and saying that there was nothing wrong with the patient when there, there evidently was on dipsticking. Mm -hmm. And so I started to work on that. And then University College London, it's got three campuses. And it, my boss decided that he was going to make me professor of medicine on the, the third campus, Whittington. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I moved there as the professor of medicine, which is the professor of internal medicine. And in fact, I, I had to sign a letter saying I give up geriatrics. So by then I, I, I 
got to Whittington and continued to beaver away with this. And then I thought, hang on, I, I, I'm getting even more suspicious now. I think that we need to start looking at the urine under the microscope. So I got hold of some cast off microscopes. <laughs> from the the path lab i mean it was like it was like louis pasteur it was it's <laughs> going back to when i was a tiny kid you know the sort of play microscopes with mm -hmm. light uh from a very odd source i mean the 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 the, the light source had some kind of um uh, electrical box that was incredibly alarming you thought bloody hell is going to catch faster <laughs> it was very difficult there's a lot of chromatic aberration and so on but it was enough to get, get to really shock me and mm. I began to realize that the, the dipsticks were lying just as much. So I, I managed to invest in some microscopes. And then for a long time, I beavered away quietly with my research nurse, who happened to be my wife as well. And she and I were doing this and we were gradually building up more and more evidence to suggest that the overactive bladder in, in many of these cases was being caused by urine infection. Mm -hmm. And we found that, that uh, when we treated the infection that was there, that um, God, it got easy to treat the overactive bladder. I mean, these overactive bladder drugs were just a walk in the park once you cleared the infection. And this was a really a sort of um, one man, well, one man and his wife show mm. for a long time. And the other thing is that when we, we were presenting the results of the conferences and so on, I was already in bad odor because I'd said that urodynamics was crap. Mm. And so I was even more bad odor by coming up with all these stupid ideas about mm -hmm. cultures missing it and things. So really, I, I was living a, a, the life. It was We were not making much of an impact. But in 2007, I got more serious and, and brought uh, Raj Kasria in as a PhD student and from that moment on I started bringing in more and more doctors to do PhDs with me and we started building up the data set more and more and more mm -hmm. and then in the around about 2007-8 we started to attract more patients who were had long histories of chronic bladder pain mm -hmm. or you know the favorite diagnosis is interstitial cystitis and applying the principles of fresh urine microscopy, which is, you know, as developed in 1928, was nothing new. We were discovering that these people were very, very similar to overactive bladder in the mm -hmm. sense that there was an infection there. And uh, the only signal was a pus cell signal in the urine. There's a, really the most probable explanation for that is infection. So we treated them with antibiotics and they all got better. Mm -hmm. And then we stopped the antibiotics and they all got worse again. So we started them again. Mm -hmm. And you end up with this cycle of uh, what we call evolutionary epistemology that built up. And it was becoming increasingly clear to us that these patients were not going to function unless we were using really very protracted antibiotics. And I then became an incredibly worried person, very, very terrible times of deep mm -hmm. worry, because I was having to use extended courses of antibiotics. It was quite clear that the, the, the cultures were half the time not telling us what's going on. And I was desperately worried about causing side effects and so on and so forth. And then around about 2013, um, Sanchuta data started to come available. And she was using um, 16S ribosomal RNA studies of mm -hmm. patients and normal controls. And it, it deeply shocked us to see that, in fact, the cultures were, um, we were then, if we, if we, in the 9% of patients, if we got a positive culture, we were treating on the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we believe that that was the right thing. But her data showed that she, this is not right. This is not right. And that these bugs that they're isolating, it may well not be the cause. Mm -hmm. And one of the effects of this, if you use go by cultures, it's a Darwinian principle, this, that what happens is that the spectrum of the antibiotics that you use, use keep increasing. They get gradually more powerful. So when I remember this in, in Christmas, over the Christmas holiday of 2013, I decided, right, we're going to abandon cultures. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I came back and said, we're just not going to treat on cultures anymore. We're just going to go on the symptoms, the white blood cells, and we're going to try and stick to first generation 
urinary antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we never looked back. It was, it was just amazing. And the resistance rate dropped. And uh, since then, we've been working on, on trying to make sure that we stick to really, really simple first generation bug antibiotics. You know, the ones that were invented when I was at school. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're really elderly very elderly mm -hmm. and if something's old and been around a long time then we know it to be safe and also that the first antibiotics that come out in any group are usually quite narrow spectrum right. and we, we nowadays we're, we're functioning with uh, urinary antibiotics i mean they're no use to anything else than treating the urine and they're narrow spectrum and i think it's coming it's it's crystallizing and we've we've gone through i don't know whether you know it but uh, Judeus Pearl, who is a, 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 an outstanding academic who, who's at, um, in California, he cracked the problem of causation, which is a really difficult one. And not only that, he produced an equation, a mathematical equation that proves the point. Mm -hmm. And so that that gave us something to explore causation when you're dealing with these diseases. Mm -hmm. And we followed... Uh, Judea Pearl's principles in testing whether infection is the causative element in this condition. Okay. Um, and he's got three runs. One, two, three. We're on the third run at the moment. We've done the first two experiments of the third mm -hmm. run, and we're, we're going to move on to do a major randomized controlled trial that will clinch it. I think it would be helpful if we take a step back and yeah. maybe you can explain to us the difference between a recurrent UTI and a chronic UTI so that people have more context for the work you do. Right. Well, the, the, the difficulty there is that acute, acute re UTI, chronic UTI, and recurrent UTI are all categories. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, um, if you, uh, Richard Dawkins wrote an utterly brilliant essay called The, um, what was it? the Tyranny of the Discontinuous Mind. Mm -hmm which was derived from a chapter in his book. Uh, I think it was the Salamander's Tale in, in um, uh, The Ancestor's Tale. And it makes the point that categories, biology does not exist in categories, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't, it doesn't. And if you try and categorize biology, you're, you're going to get into terrible difficulties. So let me give an example. It's using categories like that is like saying, OK, the rainbow, it's either blue, it's either violet or red. And uh, anyone who argues about it can shove off. All right. <laughs> it's as it's, it's crack as that. So the thing to do is, is, is recognize cat categories as they're there, they're crude tools, they're Im they've imagined by the human being. They don't exist, but they're there to give us a vague understanding mm -hmm. of what's going on. But in fact, what you have is a continuum from no infection whatsoever through to a chronic life-threatening infection that mm -hmm. can't be winkled out of the individual. And we're, we're in our infancy in trying to work out what's going on, all right? That mm -hmm. the, the, my view on urine infection is we've got to start all over again, that this is, uh, our understanding of it is incredibly naive. Mm -hmm. And we've got to, 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 to cast off all the old assumptions and just start thinking about it much more carefully. And I think the illustration of this is that, that this in, uh, most important piece of research that's about to start off in our unit, which is in fact to ex is, is to study the, in, the stories that patient produce mm -hmm. it, it, in order to, to try and find better ways of measuring the disease. Because in all the work that we've done, I'll come back to your question, don't worry, I haven't forgotten it. In all the work that we've done, we've discovered that the tests are a, a, a really a whopping great letdown, mm -hmm. all right? The tests in your, of the bladder, all of them, I would give them a, a D minus, frankly. They mm -hmm. are terrible. Yeah. 
But one of the things, absolute star turn of the patient's history and story. And in fact, the one of the things that helped us make a lot of these discoveries was, was a, a symptom score that took us 20 years to develop. Mm -hmm. But as I've been working more and more with the patients, I, I've, I've, I've noticed that they, they, they have some pretty quirky symptoms. So someone will come to you and say, well, when I have white wine, it's shit. Um, mm -hmm. The whole thing blows up and I'm in terrible thing. Whereas other people say, oh, no, I can drink it by the bucket load. Nothing yeah. happens. But if I have a peanut, then all hell breaks loose. Now, the point being is individual patients have their own experience of the disease. And we have to learn to measure that or we're not going to identify the fact that there's active disease. Mm -hmm. Now, the scale that we developed was based partly on, 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 well, no, it's based wholly on, on patients telling me their story spontaneously and me mm -hmm. constructing a scale about it. But I was using symptoms that were very, very common to all people and worked on it with the context. Now we've got to find ways of measuring using the individual experience and the mm -hmm. ways of doing it. Now, why have I gone into that? Well, the reason is the spectrum exists. So someone gets an acute urine infection and they get all the classic experiences of one kind or another, simple acute urine cystitis. And you look at the urine and you can, the dipsticks are positive and you might get a positive culture and you look down the microscope and there are all the white cells. And then those peter out first, mm -hmm. all right? So the first thing that clears is the test. Then the patient's symptoms as you measure them stop. Mm -hmm. And if I go and then say to the patient, right, that's it, you're better, they're going to go, but, 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 if I have a peanut, okay? Mm -hmm. So that there's this other area where the symptoms that are peculiar to the patient are continuing. And in my view, the person has not got better until those have cleared. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you, you, the, the first thing to say is that the acute cystitis is not the sort of, you have it and then you don't. It's quite complicated thing with a very slow process of clearance. Now, a very significant proportion of patients will get better spontaneously because their immune system clears it for them. Right. And that's where you get people saying, well, I drink lots and I I." do this and I do that mm -hmm. and so on. Now, the, the drinking lots do this and do that. It's not having any effect whatsoever. It's simply the immune system that's clearing it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a group of patients that really do need an antibiotic to help them. Yeah. And we can put on an antibiotic and we know because it's constantly um, uh, published in all the randomized controlled trials on antibiotics for urine infection, that there's a failure rate of between 23% and 37%. So I say 25%, 35%, just don't respond. Mm -hmm. But the difficulty is their tests are negative, yeah. right? So you've got the ones that just get better, 65% to 75% get better. Mm -hmm. So you've got around about 25% to, to whatever it is, not better. And the trouble is that their tests are negative. So people say you haven't got an infection. Now they can go on chronically. Mm -hmm. And as it goes on, various people will drop off that set because the innate immunity somehow manages to get rid of it. Okay. But there are, there are others who just don't shake it off. Yep. And they end up with a chronic urine infection. All right. So you, gr you go for an acute cystitis and there are all those different colors on the way until eventually you go into that group who have a chronic urine infection. These bugs have had millions of years to evolve and they're absolutely amazingly sophisticated. Some of the bugs that have attacked you, that they, they're causing symptoms because they're invading the tissue of the bladder and the urethra and the inflammatory signal makes your, 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 your tissues terribly inflamed and mm -hmm. sore and smarting. Now, while they're doing that, some of the bugs can 
get inside a cell and find the environment really rather congenial and they become dormant. And what their role is, is to become, they've got to, 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 to um, dig a trench and become um, surrogate. They, they've got to be camouflaged. They must not be uh, detected. They've got to not create a storm. Just shut up. All right. And what happens is then the whole acute inflammation and so on dies down and you've got these little sleepers sitting there. Mm -hmm. Now, they can sit in those cells for a long, long time. And one of the big mysteries for us is, is that certainly our clinical data suggested that people can have them living in those cells for years and years and years. And we don't understand that because we know that the cells of the bladder are dropping off. So the maths is that eventually they've got to get rid of them. And our thoughts were, well, if the bugs are going to uh, move from one cell to the other, they've got to wake up, start dividing, burst out of the cell and go and find new cells. And mm -hmm. that's going to cause an acute cystitis. So until in, in the book that I published, Harry Horsley got this microgross. That's amazing. And you can see a bug coming out of the cell and the little shite's dressing itself in cell membrane. It's mm -hmm. quite extraordinary. So it covers itself in cell membrane and it looks like self. Mm -hmm. And that way it sneaks off and finds a new home without attracting any immune attack. So these bugs can sit inside your cells as sleepers waiting for a day when they, 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 they decide to create some havoc. Right. And, uh, on occasions, one of them, for various reasons, will wake up, start dividing, and then it feeds on the contents of the cell to sustain that division, to feed it. And they divide, 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 and they eventually kill the cell because they just strangle it. Right. Okay. And then they burst out of the cell and you get this planktonic flare and an mm -hmm. acute urine infection. Now that, the secret little beast hiding there, not being detected, bursting out from time to time, are the recurrent urine infections, all right? Mm -hmm. So you can have chronic and recurrent, and you've got a spectrum and it, it can vary at an enormous amount. So you mentioned that you'll often have a flare up of your symptoms with the planktonic bacteria that escape into the urine. Mm. Some people say that they just have pain throughout treatment. Correct. Is yes. this why that is happening even when they're taking antibiotics? And do what, antibiotics exacerbate that in some way? Uh, uh, no, what it is, is that the thing is that in some people, do you remember we're on a scale? Mm -hmm. Some people have a, a low level action where the bugs uh, uh, in a low level way, one or two of them will wake up, start dividing and, 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 and break out and in a rather low level way, go and find other cells or mm -hmm. that they're dividing in a way so that they are stimulating an immune response. It just keeps it going. So those patients have a, a low level chronic immune response that um, gives them symptoms all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a point about those bugs inside the cell. Antibiotics will only work against bugs that are dividing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the bugs are protected inside the cells. And thirdly, they will form themselves inside the cells inside a biofilm that is, is impenetrable to a large extent. Right. So when it's in that state, you have a, a urine infection that is resistant to antibiotics. You can't treat it with an antibiotic. The way we work is we're we, we hang on the fact that part of the immune response is to shed epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. And that is the way that eventually you, you, the aim is to get rid of those bugs that are sitting inside the cells. Now, we now know that if you perturb any of these cells in the laboratory, if you so much as tickle them with a feather, the bugs wake up, start dividing, 
and 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 mount this this escape through a planktonic flare. Mm -hmm. So if we put them on treatment, that the bugs when they come out of the cells are greeted with this treatment sitting there in the urine. It kills mm -hmm. them and it 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 curtails the escape route for the bugs. So then you hang on the patient shedding all the cells until eventually by a process of constant shedding and so on and so forth the numbers of parasitizing bugs reduces and you gradually shake off the disease how long does that usually take for someone to, how long will they need to be on antibiotics well in our unit the average the average seems to be sort of round about a year with a huge variation so does it correlate to how long the person has had the infection previously it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, in fact, I'm quite pleased because we, we, we thought we knew the answer that the longer you had it, the worse it was. So we, mm -hmm. we in fact, being good science, measured it this year. And do you know, there's no relationship whatsoever, none at all. That's so you can, you can have, have had it for years and years and years and you're better in a fortnight, or you mm -hmm. can have had it for a few weeks and it's the devil's own job to get out.